Hello, uh, in this video, we'll be uh, discussing about the notion of superscalar processor and uh, outer border processor. So, so far, we have looked at uh, a scalar processor in the form of uh, five stage pipeline. So, let, let's look uh, beyond the pipeline design and how can we improve our IPC. So, as I have mentioned in a five stage uh, pipeline that we have discussed so far, uh, the theoretical upper limit. Uh, in terms of IPC is one, right? We we can't uh, pump more than one instruction per cycle, but in superscalar uh, design, we actually uh, we are trying to achieve IPC of uh, more than one. Where where uh, the goal is to fetch uh, multiple instructions in one cycle, right? So in the pipeline design, we are actually fetching one instruction in cycle per cycle. But in superscalar, we will be fetching multiple instructions in uh, one cycle. And assuming there won't be any uh, dependencies or hazards, uh, eventually we'll uh, get IPC of uh, greater than one. So to understand the, the difference uh, between uh, a pipeline design and a superscalar design, let's understand the notion of uh, instruction level parallelism or ILP that tells us how many instructions are actually currently uh, getting executed at, at a given instance of time, right? So if you look at uh, a five stage uh, pipeline and, uh, and or uh, let's say a D stage pipeline, so at any given point of time, you'll find that, that there are D instructions that are kind of uh, concurrently uh, getting executed, right? So that, that's, that's actually the ILP. And as I have already mentioned, the IPC is one because we are actually pumping one instruction per cycle, right? So uh, this is what I was mentioning about uh, the ILP uh, from a basic pipeline uh, pipeline design, where the depth of the pipeline uh, denotes uh, the degree of uh, instruction level parallelism. Now, if we move to superscalar processor, uh, as you can see, uh, the differences compared to the last slide instead of fetching one instruction now we have started let's say two instructions per cycle and this can be uh, n instruction it can be k instructions right and if all goes well that there is no dependencies uh, there is no hazard so at a given point of time we are increasing our ilp by n times right previously if you have a d stage instruction pipeline uh, design the ILP was limited by the number of stages now it's limited by the number of stages and multiplied by the number of instructions that you are fetching right so with this what can happen is theoretically per cycle we can uh, finish n instructions in the ideal world and that that is the peak IPC that I, we can expect from a superscalar processor okay so that's the uh, basic difference where you are trying to fetch multiple instructions in one go in one cycle instead of just uh, one instruction so the deal is to uh, get the ipc boost so that our performance will run for our programs will uh, run faster and this will only work out if the instructions which are fetched are kind of independent there, there is no uh, data dependence or control dependence right Having said that, it complicates the data path. You you will need multi-portal structure. Imagine a register file, right? Uh, previously, a register file used to have a read port, a write port, and all. Uh, even for a single instruction, we used to have multiple ports. Now, imagine if multiple instructions are in the pipeline and uh, they are independent. So, they, they will demand more number of ports for uh, the register file, right? So, similarly, the other data path uh, that we have discussed, it also complicates exception handling uh, you can actually work it out and see how, how things may become um, really tricky with a superscalar processor because you have to make sure that um, the, the precise state is still maintained even though you are actually fetching multiple instructions in one go okay so with that let's jump to the other uh, design which is called out of order design so this outer border processor or the outer border design is it's a completely orthogonal concept and it has nothing to do with pipelining or uh, your superscalar processor but in the commercial machines you will find that um, 
this out of order execution is uh, kind of coupled with a superscalar processor. So the notion of out of order uh, execution, I'm not talking about out of order instruction fetch or out of order instruction decode. I'm just talking about the execute stage uh, of our pipeline, if you remember. It doesn't follow the sequential order that we have been discussing so far. Let's say instruction I1, I2, I3, right? So this is actually the program order. What it follows is it follows a data flow order. So as long as it finds that there are instructions which are not dependent or they are kind of independent uh, during their execution stage, it uh, tries to execute them concurrently. And uh, it may happen that we are finishing execution of a future instruction before finishing the execution of the previous instruction. Okay. So let's let's take an example. So the, there are uh, six instructions that I'm showing here. And uh, the first instruction is a division instruction, which is taking, uh, let's say, 20 cycles. Okay. Uh, another thing that you have to uh, assume or you have to keep in mind for exploiting out of order execution, you should have multiple uh, ALUs or multiple uh, units for doing uh, addition, uh, uh, division, subtraction, and uh, multiplication, depending on the empirical results that uh, you may uh, decide okay i need two adders i need uh, two dividers i need four subtractors or whatever right because you are actually trying to execute out of order as long as there is no dependency and based on that you you will need uh, structures which can support uh, concurrent execution in an out of order way okay so if you look at the in order uh, execution mode uh, it will go one by one instruction one two three four five six instruction one takes 20 cycles but uh, you can't do anything. You have to wait, right? Uh, then only uh, you'll execute instruction two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And uh, remember, there is a dependency here. The R one is actually uh, getting a value from the instruction one, so this is actually read after write hazard. Right. Now, if we go for superscalar, remember, uh, let, let's assume a two-way superscalar, which means uh, the fetch width is two. It can fetch two instruction per cycle, right? But even if it fetches two instruction per cycle, it can't execute two instruction because instruction one and two, they're actually dependent. So it will actually execute instruction one, wait, wait for uh, finish, uh, wait for it to finish the execution, no, not the entire instruction. And then it will start, let's say two and three, which are independent. There's no dependency here. And then sequentially four, and then five and then six. Why sequentially? Because again, four and five, there is a hazard. Five and six, there is also a hazard. Right? But now if we go for an out of order execution, what it does, it actually creates a data flow graph. And through that, it tries to find out independent instructions. So for example, when we are executing the first instruction, the division which will take 20 cycles instruction 3 and instruction 4 they are completely independent with uh, the first instruction right instruction 3 is using register r5 which has nothing to do with first instruction instruction 4 is using r6 and r3 again it has nothing to do with the first instruction so which means we can start instruction 1 3 and 4 provided we have one divider and one order and one subtractor right so we can assume one divider one order and one subtractor okay so once the instruction three and four uh, complete their execution then we can actually start five because five was dependent on the outcome of uh, instruction four uh, because of uh, dependency through r6 so you can start five, right? And once instruction one is done, then only we can start uh, instruction two because there is a dependency for R1, right? And uh, similarly, we can start six after the end of instruction two because if you look at instruction six, there's a dependency between instruction two and instruction six also, right? So this this is the out of order execution. As long as we have 
multiple execution units in the form of alu order subtract or divider and uh, there is a possibility of executing them independently uh, if there is no dependence then then uh, go for out of execution okay this is only for the execution not not for the fetch or decode so the goal is if we don't have any uh, dependencies which can lead to hazards then uh, two or more instructions can execute in any order right as I have already mentioned, this idea has nothing to do with the superscalar or pipelining uh, design. It can be uh, designed independently, but uh, most of the commercial machines you will find that this is coupled with a uh, superscalar processor where you are actually fetching multiple instructions per cycle. So the IPC will even uh, improve because you are fetching multiple instructions per cycle and you are executing instruction out of order. So let, let's look at the combination of uh, out of order and superscalar. So let, let's assume that we have a superscalar processor of uh, width 5, for example, which is like a five way superscalar processor, right? So in one cycle, we are fetching five instructions. Okay, this is just an example. And then when it comes to the execution stage, you can see that instruction 5 is finishing way before than instruction 1. Right. In fact, instruction two, three, four, five, all are done before uh, in instruction uh, five, assuming they are independent, obviously. Right. So, but even though we are finishing or we are executing them uh, out of order, we need to make sure that the program order is maintained because that's how the programmer will see or programmer will visualize the state of a processor, the register container, and everything. Right. So we need to go for an in order commit. So no matter. Uh, if, if this instruction is done in one cycle, but it has to wait for this instruction to get over, then only it can uh, commit or, or the result of this instruction will be available to do uh, the rest of the processor, right? So rest of the processor meaning mostly the processor state, uh, the user, right? Uh, other uh, instructions which are using this data, they may move ahead depending on a uh, scheduler that we will discuss later but but uh, from from programmer's point of view you are still waiting for this particular point which is a commit point okay so the big picture if you try to correlate uh, a program and uh, the processing that happens in a processor so we write a program which is uh, a static program eventually you generate a, a trace of instructions and if even uh, there the compiler can come up with its own uh, uh, scheduling so that the instruction that we are writing uh, as a programmer may not be the may not be following the order uh, or the compiler may not follow the order that we have written just to improve performance and finally once those instructions enter into the processor it uh, goes to goes through the in order uh, fetch and uh, decode but eventually uh, things get executed out of order but finally, uh, we make sure that the instructions are visible in, in order, the order in which they enter the pipeline. Okay. So the question now uh, comes is what, what's the notion of commit and uh, why we need it? So the notion of commit is we need a point where the results of a completed instruction, right? The, the instruction which is already completed in the execute stage. But, but it's still uh, waiting for, let's say, the uh, uh, final uh, wrapping of uh, things. It should be visible to the programmer. So we, we need a point beyond which everything is visible to the programmer, right? And not only that, we also need the order in which the instructions are fetched should be visible to the programmer, right? So if we have instruction I1, I2, I3, and uh, even if I2 finishes first, uh, sorry, even if I2 finishes first, we have to make sure that from the programmer's perspective, I1 is visible first, then I2, and then I3. Okay. And uh, as you have discussed, why we need in order commit, uh, think about the last video about exceptions, right? So imagine we have this set of instructions and I got an ex exception here, right? So if I go for out of order commit, it may happen that 
this future instruction is kind of uh, visible to the programmer and it, it may contain stale output stale value stale data right so with the in order commit we are making sure that till ik we are maintaining a precise state because no matter what i'm doing in my execute stage even if i'm going for out of order execution i am finishing or i'm making sure that the instructions still respect the order in which they enter the pipeline right and that provides me the precise uh, uh, state information which will help me for uh, handling exceptions right so that means still instruction i k minus one everything is done i k is the exception or offending uh, instruction and everything else after that is kind of killed but if i go for a out of order processor i won't be able to do that uh, in, in a pretty straightforward way right so the goal is we should know when exactly we are done uh, per instruction and across the instruction as per programmer's view right so when i say programmer the programmer can see the content of registers right so those are the uh, main things that we have to make sure so the programmer should not get a stale value or a wrong output uh, because of out of order execution so that that's why we need an in order commit point which can take care of uh, our exception so this this is the crucial point okay so with that i'll stop thank you